Bible is thorough and accurate. That's what we're going to look at today as we study world history from a biblical perspective. The Bible is not a history book, book of redemption of the human race. But what the Bible says about history is accurate, and it's very thorough. We just write down, look down exactly what the Bible says. That's what we're going to do today. As we've seen, there are several areas where the account of history in the Bible agrees with accepted world history. But there are several areas of disconnect. And I've got to believe the greatest area of disconnect is on the issue of human origins. Simple question, where did human beings come from? The ex accepted view today is pretty much this. First, we have life. Don't ask them where that started. They don't have an answer. You say, well, it started from a comet. Okay, where would the life on the comet come from? Well, you see, there were all these other universes. There were these multiverses. That's, well, okay, where would the life come in? No. They keep pushing the question back. They won't answer. They say on Earth it began in a primordial stew or primordial soup primordial casserole with a little side of coleslaw or something. Life, it just happened, okay? Deal with it. So life happened, and then it kind of started evolving. Single-celled animals, amoebas, and bigger animals, lions, tigers, bears, oh my, and a little toto, and then, and then up, up into the primates, the apes and the uh, uh, orangutans. And according to this accepted view, as these animals started to evolve, kept evolving, we have a first human being, and that first human being is called Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon is the, supposed to be the most primitive human being, the first of those primates to become human, and they've actually named this Cro-Magnon Eve of all things. Then, these Cro-Magnon people kept evolving into the next phase, Neanderthal, and then Neanderthals evolved into Homo sapiens. Where did all that happen? Well, the accepted worldview, or the accepted history, there, there's a dilemma right there. It's generally accepted that that transition happened in Africa. So the first human being, remember who the first human being was, according to this accepted view, uh, Cro-Magnon? The first Cro-Magnon man or woman appeared in Africa. And the human race came out of Africa. That's why the catchphrase is, out of Africa. Human beings first developed in Africa, from there spread out into the world. Now, I've got to pause here because there is a, a little dilemma here in the accepted view. Well, there's a lot of them. There's a dilemma about this Africa situation. More and more evidence is mounting that they can't deny. I'm reading some quotes today where now evolutionists are starting to accept that it wasn't out of Africa but rather that it had that the human race began in Turkestan. There's three phrases I want to point out to you that evolutionists say. One of them is just a word. Asia. They'll say Asia. Second phrase is Central Highland of Asia or Turkestan. Asia, Central Highlands of Asia or Turkestan. Actually, all you have to know is it's that gray area on your professionally produced map. That's what evolutionists mean by Turkestan. It basically starts in Turkey on the west and extends over to the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley in the east. That's what they mean by Turkestan. I'm highlighting this for a reason. It'll become important. So the accepted view has always been the human beings first originated in Africa. Now more and more they're saying it, it really, the evidence says it was in Turkestan. So, but right now evolutionists still say people came out of Africa, but lurking under the surface there like that music from Jaws is all this evidence that it happened in Asia. And later I'll tell you why that's important. So the accepted worldview was that as human beings developed from the primates, the first human being was Cro-Magnon, then he became a Neanderthal, then a Homo sapiens. And according to the accepted view, he developed that way in correlation with different ages. Stone Age then the Bronze Age, then the Iron Age, and you can divide all those up, Old Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, New Stone Age, and all of them can be divided out that way. The accepted worldview, is there any evidence for any of that? And the answer is yes, there is some. For example, there certainly were those ages. There were Stone Ages, Bronze Age, Iron Age. The problem is, 
Where were those and when? It used to drive me crazy. I like to visualize timelines. I did when I was a kid. Try to go to, go to in, uh, world history books and see when the Stone Age was. The Bronze Age, Iron Age, it's all over the wall. And it's all over the place. But I'm going to show you today. There's one thing about those Stone Ages, for example. Actually, I'll probably show you next week. <laughs> those ages were away from the place where the first human beings appeared. Isn't that interesting? So there was evidence for the ages. The issue is when and where. And there's certainly evidence for these Cro-Magnon and Neanderthals. Now, we can quibble over the names. But the evidence for a Cro-Magnon Neanderthal is simply the fossils. And we can't deny there's something there. We've seen those fossils. I haven't seen them personally, but I've seen pictures. And I've seen pictures of skeletons that look to me like they're very primitive humans. We've all seen them. Some of them we don't know exactly what to do with. There are a lot of apologetics ministries. They all say they're apes. They're not apes. Not all. Because some of those Cro-Magnon skeletons, remember that's the most primitive human beings according to the accepted view, they built fires. Okay, big deal. Well, they made tools. And they also painted. The caves of Lascaux in southern France have beautiful art produced by these Cro-Magnons. They weren't apes. So there's evidence. We have to deal with that. There's also evidence for Africa. You ever wondered why it is that everyone says out of Africa? Your first human being came from Africa? Let me tell you, it's not where any fossils were found. That's not the reason they say that. The reason they say human beings originated in Africa is a very simple reason. All these Cro-Magnon skeletons simply have African features. That's the reason. See, Africans have particular skull size compared to Caucasians. Caucasians, we tend to have flat heads. Africans tend to have larger heads back in the back. All those fossils have African features. That's the reason they say that human beings originated in Africa. But remember, there's overwhelming evidence I'm going to show you today that that really happened in Turkestan. What's Turkestan? Between Turkey... What happened in Turkey significantly in the Bible? That's where the Ark landed after the flood. The, so Turkestan starts there on the west, ex, uh, on the west, extends over to the east to the Tigris Euphrates River Valley. What happened there? Well, the creation of, of humanity. I'm going to show you today that as scientists begin to say, well, the first human beings happened somewhere in there, that's exactly what the Bible says. So the accepted view, is there evidence for it? Yes, there is. But there's a lot of contrary evidence. Accepted history can't resolve all that contradictory evidence. The Bible can. Now I want to compare quickly accepted history, accepted worldview of history, and the biblical worldview because there's disconnects and there are agreements. The disconnects are this. The Bible says human beings did not come out of Africa. Where did human beings come from? Well, two places. First, human beings came from the Tigris Euphrates River Valley, the Garden of Eden. And then there was a flood. And then Noah's three sons repopulated the earth from Turkey. See, that's Turkestan, isn't it? The, the beginning, Garden of Eden. After the flood, Tur Turkey. Ararat. There's Turkestan. That's the biblical view. Then, according to the biblical view, human beings did not descend out of Africa. They went into Africa from Asia, as they went everywhere else. The Bible says human beings did not evolve from primates. They were direct creation. Now, the Bible accounts for those Cro-Magnon men. I'll show you today and next week. But they did not lead to Homo sapiens. The Bible says the first human being was a fully functioning Homo sapiens. So, now let's look at some of the agreements. There are some agreements between accepted view and the biblical view of history. First one is, no question, first civilization as we know it, first homo sapiens as we know them, originated in Turkestan. Any evolutionist I have some quotes today will say, yes, that's what happened. That's where the first human homo sapiens as we know them today appeared, 
in Turkestan. I want to pause here and just think about something. If we all agree on that, and we do, we, the evolutionists, we all agree the first Homo sapiens, as we know it, appeared in Turkestan. Then wouldn't you think, if Homo sapiens evolved from Cro-Magnon, then Neanderthal, then Homo sapiens, wouldn't all those primitive fossils be found in that area where they originated? Or how about most of the fossils? Or how about some of the fossils? Or how about one? <laughs> Wouldn't there be one Cro-Magnon fossil right there where the human Homo sapiens began? You know how many there are? There are zero. That, that Again, that highly professional map you see, the large dots indicate every place a Cro-Magnon fossil was found. They claim these are the ancestors of Homo sapiens. They say Homo sapiens first originated in Turkestan, the gray area. Well, then why is it that all these so-called primitive ancestors are as far away as they can possibly be from Turkestan? It doesn't make any sense, does it? I'm going to show you today some evolutionists having to deal with that issue. Now, how could this have happened? Think about this. These are all our ancestors. All in the most scattered parts of the earth you can imagine. And they all evolved and ended up as Homo sapiens in Turkestan. What did they do? Did they text each other? Hey, when you, when you guys are fully evolved, let's all meet the Tigris Euphrates River Valley. Checking a couple of millennia. It's unthinkable. Now hold that thought. Because you see, we've got the data. And evolutionists have the data. See, what happens to, I think, is that Christians become intimidated. Especially Christians in college. Young Christians in college become intimidated. And that's because they hear people spouting this evolution. They talk about mutations and natural selection, biology, paleontology, anatomy, physiology. And young people don't feel like they have the, the ammunition to challenge it. Because the Christian thinks, well, those people know more than I do. And let me tell you, yes, they do. Yeah, they do about paleontology and archaeology and those things. However, see, I learned something. There's a tension. I used to see with my fellow college kids. Some of us felt compelled to dispute or to confront what we were hearing. But we also felt inadequate to challenge them. We didn't feel like we were equipped. Or some Christians give up. And there's a whole generation of Christians who have bought into this whole evolution. A whole generation of evangelical Christians. I learned we don't have to know more than they do. And when I was in college, I learned I didn't have to confront them. I personally did, I learned three things. All we had to do is, one, read what the evolutionists say. Oh, that opened my eyes. Because I'd go to class and listen to it, and I would assume that's what the book said. I think many young people in college are taking what their professors say and not reading the books that were assigned. I was reading the books that were assigned to me. I was reading the books, re not thoroughly. <laughs> I was reading the books assigned to me that were written by evolutionists. And as I kept reading what they were giving me, I was amazed and how they kept contradicting themselves. And they themselves kept undermining their own position. I was also amazed how unwittingly they were all confirming the biblical picture of human origins. Every single one of them, and I brought some quotes again today, to let evolutionists prove our case. Then I learned something. I learned how to ask simple little innocent questions. Instead of confronting, Professor, I'm very curious. I don't understand. Cro-Magnon was the first Homo sapiens. Cro-Magnon developed into Neanderthal, developed into Homo sapiens. This happened in Turkestan. I don't understand why none of the fossils were found in that area. All the Cro-Magnon fossils were found like on the edges of the earth. Ask a couple of questions like that. You know what happened? No, I didn't. 
No, I didn't. I, I got A's. And the reason I did was, not that he was swayed in any way whatsoever. He was hard as a rock. Not just him, the other ones I had. They were hard as a rock. No possibility of their sway. But what it did do is that I know it influenced people in the class. And, for my sake, it guaranteed I got A's because they didn't want me to keep asking those questions. <laughs> Very embarrassing. I got some more questions for you to ask later. I found any time you see headlines in the paper, and you see them all the time. I saw one last week. A new fossil found in Israel. Did you see that headline? Oh, a great boon for evolution. Did you keep reading the article? Oh, I did. I went to the science magazine from whence the article came, and it went on to say that this finding was could undermine the accepted view that human beings came out of Africa. Yeah, just keep reading. I don't think I've ever found an article or a headline where I didn't keep reading that, uh-huh, uh-huh, they will contradict themselves. They get away with it because nobody reads it. So today on your handout, as I did last time, I brought quotes, and these quotes that I have here, every one of them are from strict evolutionists. They clearly explain. This is going to be great. These quotes, you put them together, they clearly explain. They clearly say Cro-Magnon did not lead to Neanderthal to Homo sapiens. They say clearly the first human beings were Homo sapiens. They unwittingly make the case of the Bible. Let's begin with H.J. Fleur, about 1910, and he simply stated the dilemma for evolution at that time. He says, no clear traces of the men and cultures of the Stone Age have been discovered in the central highland of Asia. Central Highland of Asia, that, that's Turkestan. H.J. Floor, The Races of Mankind, that's on page 45 for those of you listening on your MP3 players. He says, no traces of the men or culture. <coughs> Let me t tell you what he's saying. He's very simply, succinctly delineating the problem with evolution. He's saying, we know Homo sapiens originated in Turkestan, however... There's no fossils of any primitive people there, and there's no archaeological record of a Stone Age there. Yeah, I would say that's a little dilemma, wouldn't you? If you hold a position and there's zero evidence for it, he's saying there's no question. Let me translate for you. He says, I've conceded. We're not, it didn't come out of Africa. He said, I gave that one up. Human beings came out of Asia, Turkestan. But he said, there's no question about that. But the problem, there's no evidence there in that area. Well, actually, that dilemma is a double dilemma. And let me point out, let me show you another evolutionist who will tell us the double dilemma. What's the first dilemma? First dilemma is there's no primitive fossils found where the first human being supposedly evolved. Here's the second, here's the double dilemma. We go to Wilhelm Kaperis. And this is a great quote by Kaperis. And notice the two, the two words that stand out to me in his paragraph are the word all and the word no. Watch this. It is a remarkable fact. Yes, Wilhelm. Yes, Willie. It is a remarkable fact that so far all, all means all, all the fossil men have been found in the marginal regions. What does he mean by marginal regions? He means of the world. He means those dots on your map there. He says, duh, whoa. That is remarkable, isn't it? All. How many of them? All of them. Who's saying this? Is this the Bible? This is an atheistic evolutionist. He's saying 100% of the primitive fossils have been found in the margins of the world that are most unlikely to have formed the cradle of the human race. Yeah. All of them. Remember what the key word, second key word is no. No remains are known to us from Asia, <laughs> Turkestan, where most scholars who have occupied themselves with the origin of man would place the earliest races. Do you see this evolution has just killed the whole theory of evolution in that one paragraph? He said, not only is there no evidence for primitive development in Turkestan, he said, the opposite problem is, all the primitive fossils are found in the margins of the earth. <laughs> see, evolutionists themselves. Not the Bible. 
Evolutionists, evolutionists themselves say there's no evidence for their own theory. Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, Homo sapiens, there's no primitive fossils in the original area. They're all on the edges of the earth. Here's another evolutionist, Griffith Taylor, a Canadian. A series of zones is shown to exist, which is so arranged that the most primitive are found farthest from Asia. See, they keep saying that. You would think they would say, maybe our theory isn't right. <laughs> nah. <laughs> but I tell you what, I used to love to ask questions. Professor, I noticed that Gertha Taylor points out that the most primitive fossils are found as far away from possible as Asia. Well, how could that be? Drop the subject, give me an A, shut me up. The most primitive are found farthest from Asia. Those are the Cro-Magnon fossils. And the most advanced, nearest to Asia. Those are the Neanderthals. Now, I'm going to drill down into this paragraph more next week. Cro-Magnon are the farthest away from the homeland of the human race. Neanderthals are somewhat closer. Whatever region we consider, Africa, Europe, Australia, or America, we find that the major migrations have always been from Asia. See? So, evolutionists point out that the most primitive fossils are the farthest away. Now, what could explain this pattern? Hold that thought. What could explain that pattern? And as you're holding that thought, let me show you, as we think about that dilemma, about the location of the fossils, let me show you another dilemma that evolutionists themselves have brought up. We don't have to. They'll let them kill themselves. Here's another dilemma. Here's another fact. You see these cro magnets, these fossils, the so-called primitive human beings, who were found, where are they found? On the extreme margins of the earth. Let me tell you something else about them. They all look remarkably alike. Griffith Taylor, again, look at the races that he groups together as he's identifying these fossils. He's saying Melanesians, those are where? Those are the islands around Australia. I'd say that's at the edge of the earth. Negroes, 1945, that's what people said. He means Africans, obviously. And American Indians. He's saying all these primitive fossils have features like Asians, Africans, and Native Americans. Golly gee, wonder how that could have happened. Accepted history cannot account for that. We can, can't we? How can we account for that? Ham was the ancestor of the African, Oriental, Native American. So, here's the evidence from the dots. The first problem is, that all these cro magnons who were supposedly ancestors of Homo sapiens, are as far away as they can possibly be, where the area where we know Homo sapiens first appeared. Secondly, all of these fossils found at the margins, the cro magnons they look remarkably alike. Remarkably alike. So Taylor, Griffith Taylor, asks the question for us. We don't have to dig into evolution. Let him ask the question for us. How can one explain the close resemblance between such far distant types as are here set forth? You see, he's saying Cro-Magnon was the ancestor of all human beings. First quest, First problem, why are they nowhere near human beings? They're at the very margins. And how can they look so much alike? Now, how could that be? People who look alike live close to each other, right? But how can people scattered around the ends of the earth, how they all look alike? And there's something else Griffith Taylor pointed out that undermines his whole theory of evolution. By the way, Griffith Taylor never gave up on his theory of evolution. Never. There was another thing he could not account in how remarkably similar they were in appearance, and that is this. The size of their cranium was much larger than most Homo sapiens today. So, were they really primitive if their brain capacity was greater? Here's his answer. Only the spreading of racial zones from a common cradle land can possibly explain these biological affinities. He's exactly right.
They did not evolve. And do you see? Yes, thank you, Mark. That is exactly what he's saying. He's saying they didn't evolve. He's saying they descended. You see, that's what he's saying. Evolution is saying, let's, let's start to build on what, what they're saying. One, human beings did not come out of Africa. They came out of Turkestan. The area between Mount Ararat, let's say, and the, and the Garden of Eden. Secondly, the most primitive looking fossils are on the margins of the earth. Three, they look remarkably alike. Therefore, point four, they must have a common origin, don't they? If they all look alike, then don't they obviously have a common origin? See, they did not develop into human beings, into homo sapiens. They descended in some way. He said they must have descended from a common origin. All right, where is that origin? Let's let Griffith Taylor tell us as he's making the case for us. This is easy, isn't it? Griffith Taylor says the most primitive groups are found in the regions most distant from Asia. See how they keep saying that? If I were them, I wouldn't keep saying that. <laughs> I'd get a better PR person, I know that. Because <laughs> this story they're spinning, they're killing themselves. They keep saying it. In, look at this. Not just in the regions most distant from Asia, but in the most inaccessible of regions. Given these conditions, it seems logical. Watch how he gives us exactly what happened. It seems logical to assume that the racial zones can only have resulted from similar peoples spreading out like waves from a common origin. See what he's saying? He's saying more than what it would appear. He's saying cro magnus did not evolve into human beings. There were, hum there were Homo sapiens, and these cro magnus spread out from them. Now let me point out here, they're a little bit borderline racist. They're at least ethnocentrist, because they're assuming that fossils that appear African are more primitive than fossils that appear Caucasian. That's what they're saying. You catch that? A little, I go, I'll go ahead and say it. A little bit of racism. But again, let's continue to build on what we've learned so far. From the Bible? No. No. From evolutionists. First, these Cro-Magnons started as a similar race from which they spread out. So again, he's saying Cro-Magnon did not evolve into Neanderthal. Neanderthal did not evolve into Homo sapiens. Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, descended from Homo sapiens. Secondly, where did that happen? They spread out Turkestan. They spread out from Asia. Third, here's where it starts to get interesting. Griffith Taylor says, looking at the evidence, that something happened to drive these people out from Turkestan. It happened at one point in time. Think about this. Do we know of something that happened? Do we know of one event in history, early, where a group of Homo sapiens were pushed out at one event to the extremes of the earth? And four, Griffith Taylor would point out, they all have the same ethnic, they're all of the same ethnic group. All the visible footsteps lead away from Asia, once again. And notice who he lumps together. He says the cro magnons had these kind of features. These are among the Negroes, the Africans, the Congo forest. And they turn up, check out these places, on the, and look at your dots, on the eastern fringe of Asia, in the Philippines, in New Guinea, and perhaps Australia, with probable traces in Borneo. Where's Borne Borneo? Indonesia, Celebes. Where is that? Indonesia, look at your dots, they're all there. And various Melanesian islands, the islands around Australia. I think he just described those dots. William Howells, another uh, evolutionist, starts to put everything together. William Howells in 1945 says several things stand out from these facts. What facts? He's talking about the facts that evolutionists themselves had developed. All these so-called primitive ancestors are on the extremes. They all look pretty much alike. They all got big brains. The Negritos... That's what he said. A little bit of racism there. Because what he means is anybody not Caucasian, I think. But really, give him a little bit of credit. 
1945, people in ignorance did not really understand, and they call all races that had darker skin, they call them all Negritos. We would say the Asians, Africans, Orientals. The Negritos must have had a migration from a common point. You see, again, they did not develop into Homo sapiens. They migrated from something. And it is hopeless to assume that their point of origin was at either end of their range. Well, yeah, none of those started at those extreme parts of the earth, right? And then developed and met in the Turkestan. It's much more likely that they came from some point midway, which is in Asia. Duh. William Howells, 1945. Ralph Linton gets more precise. In 1936, actually earlier, and he says they, he's speaking about the Cro-Magnon people. You ready for this one? They are almost certainly examples of a type which has been pushed out to the margins. Ralph Linton, The Study of Man. He's making the case, isn't he? It's building what the first human beings were Homo sapiens. But there was a group of them who were pushed out to the ends of the earth. Not out of Africa out of Asia. Something happened. Pushed him out to the margins. Continuing on, Science Yearbook, 1966. They, again, he's speaking of the Cro-Magnon fossils. They are the wreckage of a much, of a more highly developed society. See, once again, Cro-Magnon did not lead to more development. They, dis they deteriorated. They're the wreckage of more highly developed societies forced, catch the word, forced through various circumstances to lead a much simpler, less developed life. Now, one more sum up of what we learned from evolution. First human beings were fully Homo sapiens. That started in Turkestan. Some were pushed out to the margins in one historical event. They were all the same family. So therefore, these Cro-Magnon fossils descended from Homo sapiens. We got all that from evolution. So, wherever the human race started, it had to have happened at a common point to explain the similarity of all those fossils. But evolutionists, they're saying now, Cro-Magnons were the product, not the originator, they were the product of some event that happened in history that pushed some ancestor of Africans and Orientals and Native Americans to the margins. I think we know what that was. But keeping what we've read in mind from evolutionists in mind, let's now review all these little verses we've seen from the Bible. The Bible says very few things about history, but what it says, we pay attention. There's no wasted words. Let's follow what happened. First, Genesis 1.26, let us, God said, let us make man in our image. The first human being was a full functioning homo sapiens. It wasn't a Cro-Magnon man. He was a Homo sapiens. Where did that happen? Tigris, Euphrates, at the eastern end of Turkestan. Then we had the flood. The world was repopulated. Where did the flood, where did the ark land after the flood? On the western edge of Turkestan, Genesis 8, 4, on the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. So again, you see, the Bible explains why we have that geographical distribution of Turkestan, doesn't it? Tigris Euphrates on the east, Ararat on the west. There's Turkestan. And then God had different roles for the three brothers. Genesis 9, 18, 19. The sons, <clears throat> the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, Japheth. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these the whole earth was populated. From where? From Turkey. Three brothers. God had different roles for them as we've seen. Genesis 9, 26 and 27. Blessed be the Lord. That's Yahweh. The God of Shem. He's saying the family of Shem would be the one who would transmit the knowledge of the God of salvation to humanity. He's the, Shem is the God of Messiah. He's the God of Jesus, of, of the cross. And let Ham be his servant, terrible word, his design, his designer. Remember, Ham is the one thoroughly gifted in design technology. Put him out in the desert, he'll design a way of life. Put him in the frozen tundra, he'll design a way of life. Put him out in an area where they got nothing but ice. He needs to make a house. What will he make a house out of? 
Duh. Ice. <laughs> May God enlarge Japheth. Japheth, and that means to enlarge gradually upon the earth. And that's exactly what happened. Japheth gradually became enlarged upon the earth, bringing government specifically. And let him dwell in the tents of Shem, meaning let Japheth bring government to the world, but in the context of the gospel. So God's purpose was, clearly, that Ham would go out first from Turkey. Ham goes out first. Ham designs a way of life. He's a genius. He can do that. By the way, that's why the, their craniums were bigger. They're smarter in that area. They can design a way of life. Then Japheth comes, brings a government, but Japheth comes in the tents of Shem, meaning Japheth comes bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. So the Bible says, out of Turkey, the human race spread out to the world. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth became the father of the Europeans, the Iranians, and the Asian Indians. Shem became the father of the Jews and the Arabs. And Ham became the father of the Orientals, Native Americans. And according to Genesis 10, 6, and 7, the Africans. The sons of Ham were Cush, that's Ethiopia, Mesriam, Egypt, Put, Libya, Canaan, that's Canaan. Zoom in. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, Sabteka. The sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Those are the Africans. So, the Bible can explain why all those apostles look remarkably similar. Similar. They have the same ancestor. Ham is the father of the Africans, Orientals, Native Americans. Now, what about this as an event? Let's zoom in. Again to Genesis 10, 6. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Now, Cush became the father of Nimrod. Verse 10, uh, Genesis 10, 10. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalne, in the land of Shinar. And then uh, Genesis 11, 2. The reason I read Genesis 10, 8 is that to show that the ones who journeyed out, Genesis 11, 2, it came about as they journeyed east, those were Hamites. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So Ham went out first. So far, so good. But you remember what happened? We saw it a few weeks ago. Genesis 11, 4 says they built a tower. They put a zodiac in the top for occult worship. Why did they do that? Let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Oh, famous last words. Yeah, Ham, you sure don't want to be scattered or anything. See what they're saying? They're saying, we're not going to work together. We're not going to pave the way for Japheth. We're not going to be the vanguard. We're going to build a city ourselves. We're not going to scatter. You think God's will was thwarted? Well, no. God said, you're going to be the vanguard, and just in a different way. So Genesis 11, 8, so the Lord scattered them. Who are them? Those Hamites. Abroad. Where? Over the face of the whole earth. Sound familiar? And they stopped building the city. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they weren't there. <laughs> I love these understatements. <laughs> I would certainly imagine they stopped every activity there. Get the picture? This is my opinion, but isn't it pretty obvious? These fossils, these cro magnons the one that evolutionists say were pushed to the margins of the world, the ones that evolutionists say were pushed in one event, the ones where evolutionists say it happened in Asia? The one that evolutionists say they were all Hamites? The one that evolutionists say were scattered at the most remote, inaccessible parts of the earth? Those dots? Isn't it obvious who they are? It's those Hamites that were scattered at the Tower of Babel. God obviously supernaturally transported them. I don't know if he made them move very quickly over the earth or if he zapped them to the edge of the earth. I've got a feeling he just zapped them there. One reason is, see, there's no archaeological record of their movement in that direction. But there's plenty of archaeological evidence for their moving. I believe he scattered Ham, not all of them, this group of Hamites, to the very ends of the earth. Now, fortunately, Hamites can survive. Some of those places, like in your dots, the one in California, they call him California Dude, I think. That's in the... The La Brea tar pits where he was found. I would die. Ham I, no problem. I'll build a house out of tar. What do you need? I'll find something. <laughs> Tierra del Fuego. Put me in Tierra del Fuego, I'll die tomorrow. Not him. What do they have in Tierra del Fuego? Rocks. What do you do? 
built out of rocks. Japheth, sorry? And it's cold. They can survive. And see, Japhethites would have died. Semites would have died. Ham can survive. He's got that big cranium. And you see, the cranium is the part where you have that engineering type technology. God sent them to the ends of the earth so his purpose would be fulfilled. Remember what was his purpose? Ham designed a way of life in harsh environments. Prepare the way for Japheth. Coming with the gospel of Shem. They said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to be the vanguard. I said, okay. So instead of them being the vanguard and Shapheth followed, see what happened? God sent them out to the ends of the earth and then as they started moving their way back, which is what they did. Instinctively, the Hamites started moving their way back. As they moved their way back, they met Japheth who was enlarging on the earth. Japheth was going out as he went out, he met Ham, who was coming back. As an example, the Hamites he put on the west coast of California at the Labre Tar Pits, they started moving their way east to the east coast. About the time they reached the east coast, who was there? Columbus and the Pilgrims. See, instead of going out as a vanguard, they worked their way back. Again, there's no, ev there's no archaeological evidence for their being scattered out. I think that's because God zapped them there. At the very least, he supernaturally made them move very fast. But there is plenty of archaeological evidence for their moving back. And that's where the ages come in. The Stone Age, the Bronze Age. They were not originally. Remember, the first civilization was high. The first civilization already had iron and metallurgy. These ages were Ham working his way back. Why did those civilizations then not have a quick, high culture? And that's because they're now isolated from each other. Ham together can build a, a skyscraper out of sand. Ham by himself can survive. Not by himself, but in small groups. They worked their way back. And those are the ages. And that's why you look at timelines for Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. They're all over the map as to when it happened, because it happened at different times in the world. It's also an explanation for the Ice Ages, the cavemen. Next week, I'm going to pull all that together. Before I close, I want to point out something. Remember I said that uh, Christians are intimidated by what they feel is overwhelming evidence? And I know I'm picking on Baylor again. <laughs> but you know what? They deserve to be picked on. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. Here's what I pulled from the Baylor website, Christian University. An evolution, a foundational principle of modern biology, is supported by overwhelming scientific evidence. That's just not true. That's bad science. And is accepted by the vast majority of scientists. Well, I just read to you what they say. Because it is fundamental to the understanding of modern biology, the faculty in the biology department at Baylor University, Waco, Texas, in case you didn't know which Baylor they met, I guess, Oh, as opposed to the one in Cut and Shoot. Oh, that Baylor. <laughs> Teach evolution throughout the biology curriculum. We are a science department, so we do not teach alternative hypotheses or philosophically deduced theories that cannot be tested rigorously. You know what they're talking about? We do not teach. They're teaching Genesis. So we don't teach that. Alternative hypotheses. This is Baylor. Now, let me say this. They have a new president, Kenneth Starr, as of this summer, who has seemed to indicate that he is in favor of teaching intelligent design. So we'll, we'll see. But if that's happening at a Christian university, can you imagine young people at a secular university? But you see, that's why I say Young people are buying into this because people who should know better are. And my problem with what I just read here is that they say it's supported by overwhelming scientific evidence. That's just not true. Here's a Christian university telling lies to students. Let me point out another evolutionist, Richard Leakey. The Leakey family, I'm sure you've heard of them, the, they are the evolutionists of, the, of last century and this century. 
the Leakey family, and Richard Leakey himself, the <coughs> preeminent evolutionist today. I, read a, I found a quote from Richard Leakey, and for those of you professors listening, this is Richard Leakey's book, The Making of Mankind, and it's on page 43. Here's what Leakey says. Biologists would dearly like to know how modern apes, modern humans, and the various ancestral hominids have evolved from a common ancestor. Unfortunately, the fossil record is somewhat incomplete as far as the hominids are concerned, and it's all but blank for the apes. You know what he means? He means there's no record of Cro-Magnon developing into Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. Or he says that's incomplete. As far as the record of how that ape became a Cro-Magnon, he said it's blank. The best we can hope for is that more fossils will be found over the next few years, which will fill in the present gaps in the evidence. <laughs> I can't read that without laughing. <laughs> so, so paraphrase, we have no evidence that supports this theory. Our best hope is that we can find some. Right, that's right. We don't have any evidence. Our best hope is maybe we can find some. <laughs> And then he says the most amazing thing. You're not ready for this one. Again, I hope you professors are emailing me. Thank you for listening, guys, and I hope you're hanging with me this time. But Richard Leakey says on page 43 of The Making of Mankind, if you brought in a scientist from another discipline and showed him the meager evidence we've got, he'd surely say, forget it. There isn't enough to go on. I think that's all I need to say. He says, you bring in another scientist, show him the evidence, he would say, forget it. Well, so Leakey is saying the evidence is leaky. <laughs> you see what I mean? Read. If Christians would read what they're writing, don't read the headlines. But I do think it's ironic. A Christian university says the, over, the evidence is overwhelming. An evolutionist says it's meager. But you see that what the Bible says is correct? And uh, I learned that in college. I learned to ask a few questions, like I told you before. I would just say, why are none of the fossils found in uh, Turkestan? I'd ask, why, uh, why are these Cro-Magnons cranium sizes larger than, than, than ours? Oh, you know what? They, they would shut up because they didn't want me to ask any more embarrassing questions. Oh, they knew they didn't have any answers. They, the, to face they couldn't save face, and that was it. We don't have any evidence now, but I bet next week we will for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, night one nineteen ninety eight. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. And the word commandments means decrees. What you said happened, for they are ever mine. Shem gave them to me. I have more insight than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. The Bible doesn't say much about history, paleontology, but what it says is correct. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that what you say is just very simply true. We thank you that because of that, if we know what you say, even the very simple facts, we're wiser than our teachers. Thank you that you've given us that information. Father, it's not because we're better or that we're smarter but that you have chosen the foolish and the weak to shame the wise. So we thank you for making us foolish and for making us weak because you make us strong and intelligent in you. Above all, we thank you for Jesus whose substitutionary death on the cross for the sins of those who would believe enabled us to shed that sin nature and to inherit your divine nature. Thank you for the eternal life we have in him. We look forward to seeing Jerry soon, and we thank you and we ask in Jesus' name.